Hi there and welcome to a new episode of Impact Talks. Today we have John Bergman with us. He's an educator, a teacher. He's been an educator since 1986. He has served as a middle and high school science teacher. Among others, he's also received the Presidential Award for Excellence for Math and Science Teaching. And he's been a big pioneer of the flipped class movement. So much to talk about. I am very into education lately, so I'm very happy to have you on. But please introduce yourself and tell the people what you do. Yeah, I'm John, and I guess I just consider myself just a teacher. Uh, I feel like it's my calling in life to teach. Uh, I've had a crazy, unique privilege after after I helped pioneer flip learning in about 2007. Uh, published a book in 2012, Flip Your Classroom. Became an international bestseller, 13 languages in, in the education market, and subsequently have written 11 more books. And uh, but you know, recently, actually about three three years ago after I had spent a lot of time traveling over the world helping teachers become better as teachers, what I discovered is that I, I needed to be back in the classroom teaching kids. And so the last two years, this is the third year now back that I've been teaching uh, at a school in the Houston uh, metropolitan area and it's been just amazing to just work one-on-one, -on -one, one on 25, whatever, with the, my students every day. Uh, today's a holiday for the school so I've had a chance to, to visit. I'm continuing to write. I finished a book this summer I'm continuing to, I see what I'm doing right now is kind of a, uh, <laughs> it, it's my test is, I can, I can work on testing out my ideas on how to, how to do education better. I have some strong ideas on what education can and should like for the future of, of, of the world, really. I have uh, many questions when you said that. So on the one side, I have the question which I'll ask first, which is um, what it's like teaching after so many years, I guess being almost an entrepreneur, flying all over, being a public speaker, uh, what what that experience is like, um, how did you decide to do that? And then the second thing, which we'll cover a bit later, what is the number one thing that you found uh, would make teachers kind of better? Like what was that switch that would change it from good, from bad to good? Uh, but first question is, what was it like, obviously, after many, many years traveling, doing all those things as a public speaker and then being in front of a classroom again? I think at first I was afraid, like I, I, I was afraid that do I still have it? Do I still have what it takes to be the teacher? But then as time went on, I realized that it's, it was always my calling to be a teacher. I mean, the story that is interesting is that, you know, I was traveling all over the world and I would speak at conferences and I remember particularly being at a number of conferences in Australia. And they were asking me, they'd say, John, would you ever return to the classroom? And I, I kept saying, I wonder if that's what I need to be doing again. And I was at a conference in the States and uh, right before sort of the big decision. And I was, it was a conference in Florida. I was sitting with some, uh, some other teachers at a, at a dinner or something like that. And we're just chatting. And as they told me their stories of the, the change that they were able to have happen in their classroom with their kids, that's when I realized I needed to be back in the classroom, I guess. And it was actually, uh, my wife and I took a two week retreat to, uh, uh, to Arizona, walking around the mountains of the Sedona area. And I said, yeah, I need to be back in the class. What, what was it about that retreat that you came to that conclusion? So as I was walking, I'm a man of faith and I was just walking in these hills I really felt the message was, um, I need to reach every student. So the subtitle of my first book that I co-wrote with Aaron Sams was, Reach Every Student in Every Class Every Day. And I really felt, and this sound weird, but if you're not a person of faith, but I really felt God telling me, I now want you to reach students, individual students, not you know the global students. Then you, you know, I, I was impacting teachers all over the world, which is awesome, but I want you to reach some specific students. and. I've had that privilege to do this. It's been a weird, when I jumped in, right, it's right before COVID happened, and I've been in the midst of, you know, dealing with teaching via COVID, like so many other educators across the world, and in many ways, it's been, it's been freeing. That first year, I went back to Australia, so I was still teach. I just started teaching. Uh, this is the fall of 2019, and I still had a, a gig in uh, Australia. I went back, and uh, I'd spoken at this event before, and some of the teachers came up to me and said, you know, John, this is the best keynote you've ever given. 
I said, what? <laughs> I was so underprepared. But they said, dude, you're like one of us again. And honestly, it's in, given me more impact. I didn't expect that. I just thought, well, I'm going to go back and be a teacher because that's what my calling is. Uh, but it's actually given me a bigger voice, I think, than I would have ever imagined. Because that was what I was about to ask. Um, obviously, impact talks, we deal a lot with the question of impact. And I was discussing this with a, a buddy of mine last week about how there's this constant growth, um, especially when you have a message of impact. You feel like at the beginning, it becomes very in individual. You're helping people. Then you're helping small groups. Then you're helping big groups. And suddenly, you're in front of huge audiences. And the goal is obviously to scale that impact and reach more people, make sure that the impact grows. Um, but you feel like when you went back to the individual approach that I guess how do you deal with it mentally that suddenly you go almost backwards if you look at it linearly um, or I guess what you've been saying you didn't lose impact you grew your impact somehow I feel like it's actually grown the impact and especially in light of COVID and the world that's happened in our education so much things went online and virtual I, i'm continuing to write i'm continuing i've started a podcast i've got all these other things going on so I, I i was talking to my daughter yesterday who's also a teacher and she said dad you've got two jobs i mean <laughs> and she's right i i worked on three presentations uh yesterday and another this morning i'm doing a presentation in in mexico and in chile in the next uh six weeks uh now of course everything's on zoom or some kind of a virtual platform uh so the opportunities keep arising and now i'm starting to say no to opportunities because i also am prioritizing prioritizing my students and uh but i feel like that the message is bigger i got a chance to this summer i finished a book a new book that i've written uh coming out here in the next six months or so and i think that that i'm going to have a bigger impact with the writing and then the occasional speaking then you know jetting all over the world uh, and also that's not that effective, e efficient, right? If I fly to Australia, it's a week just to do, and, and you're there for an hour, you know, pr presentation or, you know, maybe, you know, an hour plus a workshop or whatever. You're not, you're, a lot of wasted time <laughs> happens flying. Not to say I, I don't, I, I like traveling places, but it's been intriguing to me how the impact, especially of my message, I think, has obviously resonated in a COVID world when we talk about, flipped learning and its impacts uh, for the future of education. So so then maybe for the audience, can you explain what is flipped learning? How come it's so popular and that you have all these opportunities to explain it? Can you in a nutshell kind of share what it is? And It's really a, a simple idea. <laughs> uh, so Aaron Sams and I, the story goes that sort of the origin story from our perspective was that we, we were having students who were missing class because uh, we were in a small rural school and if a kid was gonna go to some type of an event, whether it was you know the chess club tournament or a basketball game, they had to leave around noon every day. And then, so we were struggling with kids who'd missed so much class and wouldn't comprehend our subject. I teach chemistry and did then too. And one day Aaron shows up with some software that would do screen capture. It was like the very beginnings of screen capture software. And we said, man, we could like record our lectures in the morning. And then our kids, we could just record them, you know, with screen capture software. And so we did that. And then our, our assistant superintendent, like a curriculum director, she came down one day and she says, I love that you're recording your, your, your lectures. I want, you know, my daughter's attending some local university here. Professor does that and she loves it. And she said this, this is, the, this is sort of the kicker. She says she loves it because she doesn't have to go to class anymore. And, and that was the moment where we said, wait a second, something's wrong with this picture. So we began to really rethink what education could look like. So what we did initially, this isn't where it sort of evolved to, but initially we were just pre-recorded our lectures. So we pre-recorded them, much shorter. And then we had the kids watch those at home. And in class, they did the stuff we used to send at home, the more difficult, say, chemistry problems. Now, now it's sort of evolved, I mean, it's sort of, it has evolved since then. And, and in a nutshell, flip learning is a, is a simple idea. It's where they, the students get some pre-learning before they come to class, whether it's with video or text. So my, sometimes my, I assign text for students to read. And then what happens is in class, it becomes an active place of learning. And I'm not sure if your listeners understand, but there was this, this, this cat named uh, Benjamin Bloom in 19, 
50s, something in that range, he developed what's called the Bloom's Taxonomy, and it's, it's a, it has to do with levels of cognition. And it's typically pictured as a, as a pyramid. At the bottom is knowledge, and then understanding, and then application, and analysis, evaluation, and creation. So cognitively, your thinking gets more complex as you go up. Knowledge is easy, understanding a little harder, applying what you know, analyzing, you get the picture. And the idea of flip learning is to flip Bloom's taxonomy, and you still need to be introduced to material, but the idea is you do the hard stuff in the class where the teacher is. Because where does the student get stuck? On the hard stuff apply analyze evaluate create but the problem is is that we so often and i did this for 19 years i sent my students home to do the hard stuff and then there was no one there to help them and now of course my students do the hard stuff in class with me their teacher present so it's a really simple idea do the hard stuff in the presence of the teacher do the easy stuff the information transfer in the independent space where the student is alone that's the big idea do you find that with this model you meet the traditional uh, schooling hours still? Can't you do, like you said, less hours in school? I'm not sure I would like that personally as a teacher. I do know some teachers who do that. So there's people who have done this in different ways. Obviously when we went to Zoom in the pandemic world, we had to we had less time face to face with our students in a Zoom room because that's the way my school operated and it worked. But I do like having the additional time with my students because I can get them so much deeper. They can learn more or they can learn deeper. I, I choose to kind of go deeper. Some teachers might say, I'm going to cover more material. That first year, for example, when we first started flipping, I covered 25 or 30 percent more content, uh, like more topics. In, uh, I taught a geology class in the geology class than I ever had before. So in that way, you can kind of go broader or deeper. Now I've kind of evolved to let's go deeper instead of broader. But maybe um, just looking at it now that I'm an adult looking back at, at my school years, um, isn't it almost better to, of course you can go deeper for the advanced classes, but isn't it better to maybe take two years of content and kind of put them into one year and that way uh, people can graduate sooner, go to university sooner, start working sooner? Yeah, I think it would work. Uh, I think there's also the the social, you know, the so social emotional stuff that students are going through, and I think the fact that I, I guess I'm still a fan of the face to face, brick and mortar school, and now I'm just using the brick and mortar time in a more efficient way. So, but I'm not askance to hearing that that works. I mean, there are people in the flip learning community who who says that's that's one way we could do it. But I also think there's a lot of value in, in learning something deeply in a school. And it's not just the advanced students. I mean, I, actually, at my school, I don't teach the advanced students. I te teach the kids who are not advanced. And I'm taking them deeper than you could ever have taken that group of students before. I, I don't have any of the honors classes like we call them here at our school. Uh, so then maybe to put it back into the context of obviously what happened, which I think maybe, you know, your calling came... 2019 you wanted to go back to the classroom maybe it was like literally for this period because uh, you l could could experience it not only as a teacher who had been already onboarded and knew his students but you could with your expertise actually navigate and come up with I'm assuming new systems so how did you adapt this system towards the whole experience that we've had in the last two years what has been different what has worked really well or went really badly for instance, what I've heard is a Zoom fatigue is terrible with students. Um, so I would love to hear what you've done these last two years and how it, well, how it started and how it evolved and how it is now. You know, it was uh, something on Twitter that someone said that was fascinating early in the pandemic. And they said, the pandemic, what every flipped teacher has been preparing for for the last 10 years. <laughs> and there's a lot of truth to that. In many ways, I felt like myself and the teachers that I had the privilege of training all over the world, they were the best prepared. In fact, I would argue, in fact, I, I don't know of one teacher of the thousands that I interact with, literally, that's, I mean, it's a big number, who wasn't asked to help their school. It's like, we need help, you've been flipping, help us out. You, you know something we don't and we're desperate. And that, that story was retold over and over again by teachers all over the globe saying, I, I my principal, my headmaster, whatever headmistress said, I need some help, you need to help me. 
So in terms of how it went, that's a great question. Uh, at first, what I found was that my students, I mean, my school maybe handled it a little bit differently than a lot of schools. We actually met face-to-face -face in our Zoom rooms. Um, but what we did, I think, wisely is that we met for a shorter period of time. And so instead of, you know, our typical school day starts at 8, let's say, ends at 3-ish. And so what we did is we said only the mornings will be times for classes. So to your point a little bit earlier, we had l lower time. So normally I see my students for 90 minutes every day. That's, the, that's what I'm seeing them. We're back in school now. So for 90 minutes every day, or every other day, let me say. So we have four classes on Monday and then four different classes on Tuesday, and that's the cycle that we repeat. But what we did is we still kept that same pattern, four classes on Monday and, two on tu and four on Tuesday. But what we had is they were now, instead of 90 minutes, they were 40 minutes. And uh, so we had a Zoom class, and then the afternoons was for uh, uh, office hours, so I would meet with students in Zoom rooms and have them do a lot of help. But the benefit of flipped was that the direct instruction I already had on videos, or I was creating them actually that year especially, I was creating them here in the studio I'm sitting in in my office. So I was creating these videos, and then I, I signed those videos, and they would do that before they came into the Zoom room. And then in the class, we would practice. And so I had to create, because one of the things that really happens in my class now is I walk around and help kids. I, I see my job as a roamer. Uh, some student is working on assignment two, while somewhere, another student who, who struggles a little bit more is working on assignment one, and another one's on assignment four, or whatever it might be. And so I'm roaming around and helping them out. And so I had to figure out a way to do this where I could visually help the students, individual students or small groups of students at the same time. And that was the big struggle for me in the pandemic time. And so I found some software. The software that I found, well, let me say this. Um, there was never a perfect piece of software that worked. I actually have thought of and dreamt of a piece of software that I think could really help the flip learning movement. It's been in my brain for a number of years and I've got this sort of and, and what I do is I, I'm using eight different pieces of software right now uh, to make all that work. But the one that worked best in terms of I could visually see a student working, literally working, what they do is they write on a piece of paper, quick upload with their phone. I would see their work. I would pull them out because they're all just working on an assignment in class oftentimes. And we do about 10 minutes of kind of introductions and let's review a couple things. But then for the last of the 30 minutes, they're working on, say, a physics problem. And I'm visually watching them happen on the screen. The tool that I found that was best for this is a tool called Formative, formative.com. That seemed to be the best tool that I could find. There's probably other tools, but that's the one that I found that seemed to work the best for me. But again, like any piece of software, there were limitations. I wanted it to do this and that and this and the other thing. Uh, and there's other things I wanted things to happen. So anyways, that, that's how I navigated that time. Another thing that I did from advice from a, uh, a, a teacher in Australia is I also created what I called helper videos. So I'd assign a series of physics problems or chemistry problems, and then I would then record a short screencast that was like 30 seconds to a minute long. Literally, that's all it was. That I, it would be like the over-the-shoulder podcast or, or video, pardon me. A student would come to me. If, if a student were to come to me, like they will tomorrow when I'm in school, and a kid says, Mr. Bergman, can you help me on question number seven? Um, I'm not going to give them the answer, but I'm going to give them some hints. So it's the helper video. And so I created these helper videos that the students can just quick access. It's the one minute, let me help you with question seven. And that has been huge. And now, now they like expect it. It's like, Mr. Bergman, where's the helper videos for this section? So I don't have all the helper videos made. Uh, <laughs> So I'm still in process of even creating this, but they love this and they'll still watch it in class because, you know, I've got a, sometimes I've got large classes and in my large classes, I can't get to every student to help them. But it's like, well, but I watch them watching a helper video in the middle of class now. Uh, and that helps because I can't help every student every moment of the, every class. And that has really multiplied me with these little 30 second to minute long video clips. Now that this whole uh, period is kind of at least I hope so, ending, at least in the Netherlands it's been opening up. Um, is there any kind of thought that you had um, to apply this on a national level, but in a way, so I'm thinking there are a lot of people like me, I, I was academically really good, but um, I didn't love going to school. It, to me, it felt kind of like going to prison. Um, and I was so happy when it finished. Um, but I guess my question is, if you have this system and, and you know those helper videos seem so great 
um, you're reducing the time that they need to spend um, isn't there any way where you can create um, at least in my country that's how it was there was a central learning system I think in the US there's the GED um, the issue however with the central learning system is everything is independent there's no support from the teachers um, because you're studying by yourself um, isn't there any way to implement this towards the curriculum which is standardized all over well all over the country um, and uh, and somehow allow people who are underprivileged uh, and don't like going to school to have the choice whether they should go to school or um, like do things by themselves either they dropped out and they want their uh, high school diploma uh, or something like that because it feels to me like the system you just described would personalize that national system and in doing so give people diplomas yeah well I, I, I'm sure it would work in that way again I'm gonna come back to I think what makes good teaching good, which was sort of a question you asked a little bit ago, is is relationships. Is that if, if you've got a teacher who cares about their kids, their students, that makes all the difference. And then that's what's really going to impact a student. I mean, it's, it's one thing to just learn stuff. I mean, if I want to learn some things, I'm on YouTube, right? I, be, I, be, I become a pretty good video editor. And I didn't take a class. I didn't walk into a building. I learned it all on YouTube. And... So there's that, I had this need to learn and I just figured it out uh, with all these, <laughs> oftentimes these 16 year old kids on YouTube teaching me how to edit videos, which is fine. I mean, whoever knows it, knows it. And so, but I'm still, I guess maybe I'm an old, an old, old person and I still see the value of that face-to-face -face teaching with students as you connect with students. But, you know, to your point, I also know, I'm also realistic to know, there's a lot of teachers who, you know, they're, they're there for a paycheck. They don't value the relationship. They, that's a reality and, um, which breaks my heart because that's, that's not what teaching should be about. But I also know that that's just, in some places that's the reality. So sometimes we need to just take charge. Go ahead. Yeah. In defense of those teachers, sometimes it's just overwhelming. Sometimes it's not 20 people in the class. Sometimes it's 50 people in the class. Um, so it's just overwhelming for them. They can't get to all the students. So that's why my question, uh, why isn't this implemented in, I guess, the place where people kind of really need it, which is the standardized national system where people get their... I, I don't know how it is exactly in the U.S., except I know what, that the GED exists. But in my country, it was just national uh, in the capital of the country. And you would go there either to, if you failed your classes or in my case, I wanted to um, end school earlier. So I took two years into one summer. And then that summer, I pretty much skipped a year and went to university a year sooner. Uh, but it was my choice. I, I didn't want to go to school anymore. So I just did the equivalent just in the capital of our country. Uh, but I had to do everything by myself and partially was because the teachers were not so engaging and I, I found them n not like he, what you're trying to say people who are passionate about their subject who do the extra effort I tend to respond to those type of teachers um, but I find almost when you're telling me this story how great would it be to have this in that place where the underprivileged go or the people that just don't like school go and, I, and it would work it would work and i think uh, but not as well as you know the best of teaching comes with that passionate educator right who's working with the students i mean there's been some research about like say MOOCs. you know you get a big MOOC, and you know the completion rate unless there's some kind of a personal connection is oftentimes going to be low. Now, if you get the right person who's really motivated, the MOOC is great. There's like, I really want to learn this. You know, even my example, I wanted to learn how to video edit. I was very motivated. I figured it out. I learned it. I didn't, you know, have to go to school. So I think there's a there's a there's a route for that. But I think a lot of students they need the personal touch and the personal connection. And but sometimes they're not getting that. So what you're describing would be better if you if the teachers, you know, again sometimes through no fault of their own. Uh, they're just have been put in a system. They had a particular expectation. Yeah, and even you think about the pandemic, and 
I don't know if this is true in Europe or the rest of the world, but in the U.S. there's been so many teachers who basically said, yeah, it's time to leave the profession because I, I'm done. I'm done with this. The pandemic has just pushed them over the edge because they agreed, you know, when they first started teaching, there was a certain sort of, uh, if it's agreement's the right word, this is the expectation. You're going to stand up and you're going to talk at your kids and you're going to do this thing. And now they can't do that. And, you know, Zoom fatigue, as you talked about earlier, is a real thing. Students, it's, it was a disaster, frankly, for a lot of students. I have friends who talked about just the disaster that they're, their education was for their kids over the last couple of years and I get it and, and, and I'm not blaming the teachers here for this because they were thrust into this too quickly we as an educational community didn't embrace the change that was coming fast enough and then it was forced on us overnight in some cases it's like you're at school one day the next day is like figured out you're doing remote learning and they were like whoa wait you know there was you know no training it was but now we are a year and a half in or whatever, right? And we should, by now, at least have some sense of how to do it. And there's still schools that are desperately floundering right now. So I guess I, w I will kind of take it from a different angle. How do you convince schools or maybe even teachers um, who are quite traditional, have um, problems with innovation, to adopt the system that you propose with helper videos, um, you know, having pre uh, videos, pre recorded videos, uh, and then have a more active learning during the class itself. Uh, how do you bring that to a school? Because uh, I'm assuming at the end of the day, you're like one person. If we have like at least a thousand people listening to this podcast who want to go and do it themselves, suddenly we're impacting a thousand more schools. So to those people that want to go and help those schools, maybe they have children and they want to convince the principal of that school to start adopting these things. What is it that you say or how do you convince them and explain to them that this is the right way, everything they've been doing so far is old and is not working optimally? Well, ultimately, that is the biggest challenge is convincing educators to change. And at some level, that's been my quest for the last uh, 12 years or something like that is to help teachers to rethink what they do and uh, certainly in my role I've, I've had a stage and on that stage I have been pretty convincing to a lot of teachers and I've got different ways that I can communicate I am uh, pretty good at communicating and I think I can talk to teachers one thing that helps is that I'm not talking from somebody who came up with an idea out of the blue and I'm a college professor trying to tell K-12 educators how to do stuff and it's just my idea for pie in the sky. It's something that I do every day with students and I think that helps. So what I often get a question sort of to, to tweak your question a little bit is that I've got a lot of teachers who are doing this alone at their school. They've, they've drank the Kool-Aid and they've said I'm doing this but how do I convince my colleague across the hallway? And my suggestion to her has always been be the best flip teacher you can be. And I think that that starts the change. Uh, I mean, I'm not sure we can make huge changes fast. I mean, that's just the reality. I don't know. I, I, I was at a conference uh, a couple of years ago, right before COVID, and I had a chance to listen to Eric Mazur speak. Eric is a professor at Harvard and really has also led the flip learning movement at, in the higher education market. He's become a friend. And he told an interesting story, and the story was this. He says there were two kinds of changes that happened in the field of medicine uh, in the eight, late 1800s. Uh, one was um, anesthesia, and one was antiseptic. So in anesthesia, the, the guy who helped develop that, there was, there was a dentist in Boston, and then there was a, a, a surgeon. They were friends, and they started anesthesia. So if you remember, if you remember your history, I'm sure you know this. That but before anesthesia, surgery was a brutal affair. They had to literally hold people down as they cut. Surgeons, in fact, had to learn how to do surgery fast. That sounds scary, but they would learn to do surgery fast because the person would literally be writhing on the table. And when uh, they figured out how to use anesthesia, these two uh, Boston with dentist and a doctor. It, that went through the world in literally months, and every surgeon in the world was using anesthesia within months. It was absolutely crazy rapid change. 
At the same time, another problem in surgery was that people would die two and three weeks later of sepsis, infections. And uh, I think his name was John Lister, was a doctor who said, well, what if we were to like clean our instruments before we did surgery <laughs> and all these kinds of things. And, you know, he, he was working with the work of Louis Pasteur, who would figured out germs, all this kind of stuff. And he had he started to prove that, you know, cleaning your instruments before your surgery, the chances of somebody dying went significantly lower. And so Eric's big observation was you have two kinds of change. Oh, and let me back up. So he was introducing this. And, and beef, it, it took 45 years before that became standard medical practice. So one happened within months. One happened 45 years later. I may have the number wrong, but it was like 40, 50 years, something crazy before it became standard medical practice. And Mazur said this. He says, there's two kinds of change, fast change and slow change. Fast change makes the job of the person who's doing it easier and you see immediate results. Right? So immediately, you have a docile patient because he's asleep when you're doing surgery on him. Right? It, immediately, you saw that, and it made your job easier. But for anesthesia, or, or antiseptics, right? for cleaning your instruments and you know, sterile procedures and all the stuff that we all know is standard medical procedure, it was not easier to wash up your hands between surgeries. All right? It was a lot of extra work, and you didn't see immediate results. Because the immediate results, I mean, the person didn't die. They didn't see the infection. In fact, they probably didn't even see the infection because the person, they're done, they're on to the next surgery, and three weeks later, the guy dies. And I believe that we are in, obviously, in education in that second stage. We are, we are in more like antiseptics than anesthesia. And we are in the midst of slow change. But I think it, 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 it's been accelerated by the pandemic. I used to have to spend a lot of time teaching teachers how to use the technology that I use. The beauty is they all know now how to use it <laughs> because the pandemic forced them. How do you make a little video? How do you, I mean, I don't have to teach that anymore. Teachers, I was like, oh yeah, which tool to use? Okay, which that's fine. Yeah, there's 20 of them, whichever one you want. Makes no difference. So a lot of the stuff has been accelerated by the pandemic in a good way. So I'm not sure I was answering your question. I, I got on that story, and now I, <laughs> what was the, the gist of the question? Oh, how do I convince people, right? Yeah, how do you, if you're a parent and you're trying to convince the principal, if you're a startup in education, want to convince them to adopt new technologies, what is the conversation? How do you start it? How do you make them not be stubborn? Uh, I guess in my TED Talk, I, in my TED Talk, I, I have these series of slides that I think are very convincing. What I did is I Googled the word school followed by a country code, and I found images. And I just go slide after slide after slide. This is what a classroom looks like in India, and all the kids are facing forward. This is what a classroom looks like in the United States. All the kids are facing forward in a nice neat row. Here's what a classroom looks like in Spain and Paraguay and da 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 I mean, with 20 or 30 slides. And it's like, wait a second, what's wrong with this picture? Classrooms have looked like this for so long. And the question is, is, is that what really makes a difference? And then I close the TED Talk out with pictures of slides from all those years of traveling of flipped classrooms that I visited. Or I asked my flipped class friend, send me pictures. And the pictures are starkly different. It's like, don't you want a class like that? And so that's the big message to educators. You want, you know, we talked, we've said a little bit of negative things about teachers. But I also know that when the teacher got into the business of teaching, my guess is they really didn't think they wanted to be that boring teacher from the front of the room. Nobody wants to be that, right? And so do you want to be, do you want to make a difference? They, most teachers got into teaching for the right reasons. And sometimes, sometimes along the way, they've lost their way. Um, and I think if you can call them to that and say, I mean, I, I get this. I'm asking teachers to do something hard. This is more work. I, my job is harder because of the, what I teach. It'd be so much easier for me to do what I did for 19 years when I first started teaching, standing up and doing the lecture thing. I mean, I got to the point where and I, I taught advanced chemistry, like college level chemistry to high school kids. And I'd walk in and say, what's the topic today? Boom, I would just, boom, chalk, me and chalk. And I would just, I could just lecture it. I didn't need notes. I just knew my stuff so well. It was easy, it was really easy. But when I had to, when I realized that it wasn't what was best for my students, I switched and then I saw the results. My gosh. 
that can be addicting too. I'm working with a teacher at my school, history teacher, and he sent an email the other day and he said, I have never seen test scores like this in my entire career. I don't know what's going on. Because he started to drink, you know, he's, I have lunch with him on a, continu- a lot of basis. He says, yeah, Bergman, <laughs> he's talked me into doing this. And he's just like, I'm pretty sure it's working. <laughs> it is. And, uh, yeah. So I, that success is pretty, and he's, he's an old coot like me, a couple of old teachers. And it, yeah. when they start, when you start seeing it working, you got to keep doing it. So there's also research. Another thing you could uh, share is that there's over a thousand peer reviewed studies about flip learning now. It's crazy. And the vast, vast, vast majority of them say it just works, it works, it works. So if you believe in research, you know, if you're a university professor and you're listening to this or watching this, whatever, um, I know you believe in research. I mean, you got a PhD, you had to do research. And research says it works. I mean, how else would you argue, right? Just for the listeners, what can they imagine? You were describing the images from the TED Talk. What can they imagine with the flip learning um, images? That uh, Oh, yeah. You just see kids engaged doing stuff. I mean, I've got kids jumping ropes. I've got kids just talking, smiling, um, acting things out. Uh, it's Let me back up. I said that relationships with makes good teaching good. Actually, I think there's two key things that makes good teaching good. It's relationships plus active learning. And and I'm not just saying this out of the side of my hand. It's just as what John believes. But if you look at the research on education, and there's a, there's a, there's I don't know thousands, hundreds of thousands of re- papers on what makes good teaching good. And I'm I'm a simplifier, and I believe if you were to boil them down, it boils down to those two categories: relationships and active learning. And flipped learning is a way to get you to do active learning. So my students are. If you were to walk into my classroom, they're often, they are almost always working on something different. I got three students in a corner working on an experiment, another three students working on a different experiment. I got some kids working on mathy problems, some kids talking with each other. There's about five different things happening in the classroom and they're all actively learning. That's, that's what my classroom looks like, yeah. And the vast majority of flip classrooms, they look that way. So uh, I really liked how you explained about how to convince teachers at the end of the day they did get into it for the right reasons how do you convince the principal or the board of the school because i can imagine that's a different conversation than the teachers sometimes out of my experience the teachers want to do something different but they can't uh, usually the number one a restriction is budgets so how do you have that conversation with a principal uh, where you might bring up it doesn't restrict the budget and then I've had this conversation in the past the second right away comment then is oh but you know it's a standardized program we can't change anything because it's on the federal level or something uh, so so how do you have that conversation with a principal or a board? I'm going to actually argue it's easier to convince a principal at least today the principal is very motivated to have their test scores rise. And one of the things that is, you look at the research about flipped learning is that it increases student achievement. And every principal wants their students to achieve at a higher level, whatever that means. Whether you're teaching at a very disadvantaged schools, you wanna move up to a certain level, you're teaching in an exclusive school you want. So if there's a piece of, of data that seems to help them that way, and they also know, because they've walked into all their classrooms, they know the teachers who are just lecturing at their students and they know it's not working. They'll sit in the back of a classroom when they're observing a teacher and they'll see kids just asleep or just disengaged or texting their friends or whatever they're doing and not involved in the lesson. So they get it. And so if we can convince them, just, I don't think it's a big lift anymore uh, to convince most principals. That said, and I have known flipped teachers who have been, I know of one right now who was fired, this is now seven or eight years ago, because he wouldn't put his desks in night niece rows so his students could be taught to. Uh, but he was so quickly snapped up by another principal, said, wait, 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 you, you can help us with flip learning? I'm hiring you tomorrow. And it was a better situation. So there are still some ultra, um, I know, old school principals out there. So there, that exists. I've seen that as well. But I think it's not as true as it used to be. So Maybe a different question, um, because I'm happy that it evolved. Uh, how does a, a classroom look like from 
before when you were teaching to now and kind of you know 12 years later or longer um how are the kids different how's the climate different obviously the difference since then and now is iphones has that impacted in the teaching can you elaborate more on that honestly i don't know that kids have changed that much uh the needs of a 16 year old kid aren't much different today than they were when i started teaching in 1986. Uh, <laughs> they're insecure growing up trying to figure out who they are uh, yeah, how they access each other has changed. You know, there's, you know, when I started teaching in 1986, their cell phone wasn't a thing, right? Uh, there was no Twitter or Facebook or Insta or TikTok or whatever. And so, yeah, they're, they're huddled around their devices now more than ever. And I guess I would rather infiltrate their culture instead of fight it, I guess. So one thing, I, in one of the books that I wrote, I wrote a book called Solving the Problem of Homework by Flipping the Learning. And in that book, I surveyed, I don't know, it was 2,000 different kids who are in flipped classes. And I asked this question. I said, has flipped learning increased your screen time or replaced your screen time? Right? So kids are going to be on a screen. Heck, I'm on a screen. I'm on a screen right now. I'm on a screen all the time, as, as most of us are in the world. We're sitting for, staring at a screen. And I don't know if the number was 85% or 75%. It was 75 or 80, something like that. Said that it replaced at least part of their... It either had little impact, it, had, it completely replaced their screen time, or it, uh, it, was, it was very minimal. And so the point was, is that... Would, would I rather have my kids watching a TikTok video... Or would I rather have them watching a cheesy video about me teaching them how to do a physics problem? And so I am actually giving them something valuable for them to learn instead of some cheesy TikTok video, right? And so that's what they said. And I think that that's a, that's a reality. I mean, let's, so let's infiltrate the culture instead of fight the, fight the culture. Now that said, and I have a rule in my classroom. So my kids are issued a laptop at my school. They all have a laptop. And they can have their laptop at their desk, but not their phone. Their phone goes in a backpack, and the backpack goes in a, in a pile uh, because it is eminently distracting to them to have, you know, all their notifications and chimes and beeps and whatever. No, 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 you, you, don't, you can't have that. So, and if I see it, I'll take it, you know, and I'll just put it on my desk and they can retrieve it after class because I have discovered that that is an issue, is that it's, we live in a very distracted culture and... I think it's very important to teach kids how to not live constantly connected to a device. Uh, yeah, I, I've actually thought about teaching a class to my students, you know, like a separate class, not just a science class, but I've thought about creating some kind of a class that helps students learn how to be focused because focus, those who focus will win. Uh, who will be the leaders of tomorrow? It's those who can turn off their notifications, have time to deeply think, and be distraction free so they can go deep. You've got, this morning, I'm working on a presentation, a brand new presentation for a conference that I'm gonna be speaking at. And I went to Starbucks and I turned everything off. There's no notifications except I had PowerPoint up, Google Docs, and occasionally I would go out to a, to a and actually I have a book, a paper book, here it is, right here. All right. I have been taking notes on what I want to do in this, in this conference. You know, old school paper, uh, and I'm now translating that into a presentation. So I've been writing and writing and writing, old school. And I, I think there is some value to these kinds of things that we need to teach our students to not be that person who, you know, you they they've told me that they get into TikTok and you know they're there for four minutes, all of a sudden it's two hours. You know. Yeah. True. Same. <laughs> Um, so we actually had the uh, general manager of TikTok Central Europe on for episode 50. So she started explaining why it gets so addictive. <laughs> it, it's a good one. They are trying to obviously make it fun and positive. And on, if I'm looking at it from all social medias, I agree. TikTok is a more positive experience, at least for me, than, than if I go on Facebook. is Oh, it's horrible right now. But... Um, um, hope they fix it though because i've always been a fan of facebook but um 
you at one point mentioned they have uh, laptops. Do children have laptops in the class now, or does that? Yeah, that's it's common across the U.S. I'm not sure it's just true in the U.S. Is that you'll, they'll be issued like a Chromebook or a laptop, depending on the school and the funding. Oh, they get issued. Yep. Mm -hmm. So they all have the same device, so that if a teacher is going to do some kind of a technological based thing, if they want to make a video or our school's Google School, so they're always using Google Docs and you know all the the Google Suite. And they've gotten, you know, I can share docs with students and they share with me and et cetera, et cetera. So uh, that's replaced books then. They now have only one laptop that they carry in their backpack. Good question. Some, some classes still require books, paper books. Um, what I've done is I've, I've decided that there's some good online. I still use textbook, but it's an online textbook so they can read the textbook online etc etc for certain things so there's I will sometimes will assign the, the actual textbook but it's an online textbook for them to access and so yeah they, there's less weight for them to schlep around which is nice but some classes are still using textbooks I'm not sure that it's necessarily bad I mean even if, if for me if I want to read something uh, deep um, I want a paper book I've just ordered a book supposed to arrive today actually to help me for this presentation and I wanted a paper book so I'm getting a paper book sent to me and I'm going to because I'm going to mark it up and think about it and and uh, but if I'm going to read some fiction or something like that I want it on my Kindle you know if it's something sort of a light reading but if it's a deeper reading I, I, I need it in paper and maybe that's just because you know I'm old I don't know <laughs> well I think from what I understand in learning there are learning styles and so I guess my question around learning styles is um, there are many different styles. Most of them are classified into like some categories. I know that one of the categories that surprises me always uh, is the auditory people, the ones that learn through listening, not specifically seeing or watching or feeling or anything of those things. They truly just learn from listening. So they prefer the podcasts, the audiobooks, stuff like that. Uh, I noticed that in schools, just like because there are so few that are only auditory I, I know very few people that are like that but they definitely exist um, but schools are definitely not considering them so my question is in that same aspect uh, in flipped learning especially in classes like history where you're uh, helping your colleague has there ever been considered to tra to kind of transfer the history books into audiobooks like Discovery Channel or the BBC when they have those documentary. I mean, I learned everything about the World War, the First World War, the Second World War, all these things from those places more than I did actually from school. Um, so has has that been incorporated in flipped learning? Is that a possibility uh, for those students? There's no 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 reason why you couldn't assign pre work as a podcast, uh, and a lot of people do. So in my context, it hasn't been as useful because I'm oftentimes teaching students how to do a physics problem. You need to see me doing it as opposed to, uh, so there are in chemistry kind of the same in my context, but I do know teachers and I think you're right. And like, especially in the history context, you know, I'm an avid podcast listener. To, um, I listened to two podcasts this morning. I, I'm a big fan of listening. I don't want to watch it. I, I, I because then I can be doing something else. I'm out for a run. I'm out for a walk. Um, I'm commuting to work. Uh, so I put a podcast in. That's just what I do. And I learn a lot that way. So I'm always looking for good, engaging podcasts. Uh, and I think a lot of people, I think we need to incorporate that into our, our school. And that's a, a way to not waste time. And it's sort of screen time, but not really, because I could be looking at the stars and while I'm jogging in the morning and, and still listening to whatever podcast I've got on. But to almost jump into assumptions from my end, couldn't you take a subject like history uh, and the whole subject is usually based on one book or two books and just make that book an audiobook and then pretty much go down from one class a week to one class every two months or something? I think you could, but there's also such value in that discussion. To All right, so you want to talk about the causes of World War I or whatever, let's say, and then, so for example, I know a, a history teacher, uh, I, I focused on him or uh, highlighted him in one of my books, and he told me an interesting story is that, you know, he had made, I think it was a video, but it could have been an audio file, about what happened as World War I was starting. And, you know, this is what happened, you know, France, Ferdinand, 
you know, there was an assassination in Serbia, all that stuff. I, I, I vaguely remember the history. But then what he said is that what we did is when we came into class is we to, and we talked about, you know, this is U.S.-centric, he said, why did the United States enter World War I? So it's a much deeper question. And that was the conversation. But they'd all got in the background about sort of what happened and who did what to whom and why. But why did the United States decide to enter into World War I? And now we can have a... a, a a social moment as a, as a class to have this conversation and to go deeper using the background knowledge that they'd all gotten from whatever that pre-work that the teacher had assigned. And I think that's where there's, there's the deep value. Because another thing that I would say about learning, learning is also best done socially, right, with, with other, others. And if you can bounce ideas off your peers, you know, and then if you have the expert in the room, the teacher who, who's really good at this concept, you, this can be done such a much richer, uh, richer experience. If you are, I guess that's what I'm understanding from what you're telling me. At the end of the day, if you do this flipped learning and you incorporate all these things that almost seem logical to some students, at the end of the day, you get an experience in class that becomes more like a philosophical discussion or an experience based learning ex uh, thing, activity based, uh, instead of just somebody standing in front of class. I mean, people standing in front of class is it, it needs to go the way of the dodo bird because the reality is is there's probably a better presentation of the causes of World War One or whatever you want to talk about on YouTube with somebody who's done it crazy engaging uh, with animation and I mean that exists and it's better than boring teachers standing up and lecturing better than me standing up and teaching I'm a good lecturer I mean the crazy thing is I'm a guy who I'm a good lecturer I was a good lecturer and I gave it up uh, I haven't lectured in class since 2007 so, I mean, I don't, and I was good at it, you know? I mean, yeah. Um, I guess we're, we're kind of already like going into a next subject that I really wanted to cover. I, I completely understand kind of the school experience of students now. Um, however, there's a very high trend happening now. Uh, with online schools. Uh, this was even before the crazy two years that we just had. It's, it's uh, I mean, that just accelerated it. Online schools, online universities, but especially a lot of people who have courses. Uh, it's becoming a thing. It's definitely not going away, and it's only going to get uh, bigger. One of the things that I noticed is the teaching aspect there is completely missing. Um, so these people... Number one, obviously, they want to get a course out and get a community, students, and obviously have an engaging community so that their content becomes more rich to learn from. But how do you do that in a way when there is, there is no classroom? Um, these people sign up for an online experience. How can you make that online experience rich? but scalable as well because these people tend to have more than 20 students they tend to have thousands of students I know people that have 10,000 or more students so how do you apply flip learning or everything that you've learned to somebody like an online university or an online course and make that experience rich well, I think you're you're hitting the the struggles of online schools is how do you build community and there's sort of different models. Number one, like a completely asynchronous model where the, the, there is no direct contact with the teacher per se. And, and I've had some experience. I created um, some certification courses on flip learning and we had thousands of people who went through those programs. And it was me recording videos uh, that were engaging that taught teachers how to do this. And we had like it's literally thousands of teachers who went through these, these programs and still are in fact and we had great reviews on those and I think a lot of it is that it's important that the teacher is authentic and I think another thing that we did is you know the teacher needs to learn when you're going to create videos if you will how to really be engaging and engage with the audience like like actually staring at the camera so it feels like it's more personal I mean, we've all got a TV show probably that we like, and we feel connected to the actors and the actresses. There's something about them that draws us. We, we, they, they bring us in. And I think that's it. And so like the courses I'm talking about right now that I created were asynchronous. They still are asynchronous classes that teachers take. 
and they feel a connection. There's also a community. You bring in some kind of a, we have a you know discussion forum, and I think it's important that I get in there occasionally and spend some time talking with them and as they discuss amongst themselves. But from a time perspective, I don't have time to do that day in and day out, especially with my busy schedule. So it's just something I'll pop into occasionally. So that's more the idea, I think, if you're trying to create an asynchronous environment. If it's somewhat synchronous, though, I think it can be very different. So one of the, just as the pandemic was starting last, whatever it was, 2020, it's, it's all merged to me. Um, for these certification courses, I actually created a module on how to teach well online. And so I interviewed people who've been in online education for a long time, because in many ways, these guys knew how to do it. They've been doing it for decades, many of them. And so I interviewed online ex teaching experts and said, what are you learning? And But one school in particular that fascinated me, I've actually had worked with this school. They invited me to go work with them one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. They're in Adelaide, Australia. And I was, I'd been there a few times uh, in my travels. And I, I, you know, and I also did a lot of consulting like over Zoom with them. And they, they're an interesting school in that they are a school uh, that started out as a correspondent school back in the day for students who lived a long, 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 long ways away. And there was no teacher, basically, who could go to the, literally the outback of Australia to teach the students. But now it serves kind of kids who don't fit. Kids who've dropped out of the traditional school for a lot of reasons, maybe some of the reasons that you alluded to earlier, and they don't fit. And this is a completely online school, and they meet once a week. So each class meets for one hour a week. So you have a math teacher who teaches math, but he only has them for one hour a week. What is he going to do in that one hour? That is, they still get full credit for a regular class, and they make this work. And... I still think there's that value in they, they then the, the question I ask them is that if you've only got an hour a week, then is so that hour matters a lot. If you're going to stand up and lecture during that hour, even on a Zoom room, bad. And they knew that that wasn't working. And so that's where I said, let's let's rethink what you can do in that hour. And a lot of what they do, because I interviewed at several teachers who are in this school, and now they spend a fair amount of time building relationship. Uh, and connecting with students. And that's actually the, the teacher who got the idea about the helper videos. I got that from him because for years and years and years, he'd been doing, he taught upper level math to students. And you know he can't really be hovering over them and helping them because he only has an hour a week and they need more than an hour a week. So he says, I, I created these helper videos, John. And I said, oh, that's what I'm gonna do. So uh, those are the kinds of things that you can do if you can get some synchronous time with your students in an online environment. And I think that's the ideal if you're going to have some kind of online course is that, you know, you bring in some synchronous time. But it's not going to always – I mean, some models don't have that, right? A lot of corporate training – I've worked with a number of corporate clients, and in their corporations, you know, they, they, they you know, go through this module so you can get this checked off so I know you know how to do this or that. You know, so they, they don't have any face-to-face -face necessarily time. Sometimes they do. What does uh, relationship building mean for you? What is it exactly that they do in that one hour? Do they go to the bar, drink something? Like <laughs> no, it's in a Zoom room. You know, it, you start off. I mean, I, I do this today in my face-to-face -face class. I have an interesting question every day. Uh, I've got a list of interesting questions I found on the internet. Uh, like just yesterday or Friday, whatever today is. Last 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 class. The question was. Um, you're the same kind of weird if, <laughs> finish that statement. And so my students said, um, if you like Star Wars, if you sleep with your socks on, if you um, don't like eating steak, uh, if you, I mean, it just, and this is a little bit, you know, we're now, I don't know, seven weeks into school. And so my kids are starting to feel more comfortable. That's kind of, so they're admitting to sort of being weird, which at first for a teenager, that's a pretty tough thing. But I started off with much more or less uh, personal questions and, and that's built a community in our class where we can we can have fun with each other and stuff like that so a lot of that, that that's the thing that you can do for, and that takes four minutes I mean then that's that's a little thing and then we get into you know let's start working here's the things you need to do I don't know these are the things that connect people to people which is what we need to do and in this COVID world we're not connecting to people like we used to because we're all isolated and this is especially true of teenagers. This has been really, really, really hard on, well, not just teenagers, but students in general, because they need that social interaction. What is uh, something that 
doesn't get to get doesn't get asked often but but you want to share like maybe when you're prepping your presentations you always kind of have it written down somewhere but yet it just never gets covered or very not very often gets covered but it is quite important um what is is it like a topic or a tip that you tend to share do you have something like that i'm usually just going to be the guy who just says it (laughs) I can be blunt if I need to be. And if there's an elephant in the room, I'm willing to point it out. I don't know. That's a good question. Maybe there are teachers who just don't know what they don't know. And I guess that's my question. What is it that they don't know that they should know? I guess if I, here's maybe the tack I'll take on this question is I want them to know how radically transforming this is for your teaching career, that it will radically transform how you interact with your students. Because the thing that was fascinating to me is I thought I knew what my students knew or didn't know before I flipped. But then after I flipped, I became so much, much more aware of their struggles. Their struggles academically, cognitively, but actually, interestingly enough, of course, is is this, this enhanced my relationship with my students. I also now know more of their other struggles, you know, their the drama of being a teenager, the, 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 psychosocial, the psychosocial stuff as well, that I didn't realize that I didn't know. Because there's something about standing in front of a, of a group of students that puts a distance between you and them. But now, if you try to, it's, it, it was a joke for a time. It's like, where is Mr. Bergman? Because when, it, when a, somebody would walk into a room to, to deliver a message, where do they look? They look to the front of the room for the teacher. But I'm never at the front of the room, so I'm... I'm sitting with a student, or I'm walking and talking with a student. I'm roaming, 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 roaming. I'm not at the front of the room, except for the first five minutes when I'm asking this little question of who, the weird, or whatever the question is, and that's where I'm, you know, checking off who's there, it's attendance and stuff like that. But yeah, I guess I want them to know that it could be so much, much more. I think that's a good one. We're kind of nearing the end, I guess. I would like to ask you the question before we close this of uh, is there anything else you'd like to share? Uh, Obviously our audience is mostly um, creators, people who start businesses, people, maybe investors. What is important that you'd like to share with them? Well, I said this earlier and I have this idea. I've been even like mapped out. I think there needs to be better tools to do the kinds of things that we do. I have a friend who's done some software design and he says there's a way to create software that forces people to do the right thing, <laughs> so to speak, because you built it into the, to the UI of the software. And I've been sort of dreaming up what that could look like. Uh, you want something that's gonna make it ish easy, but I also know I'm asking teachers to do something that's not easy, that's harder. But that's okay because sometimes you have to do hard things to get good results. I mean, that's just a axiom in life, isn't it? If you work hard and to accomplish anything, it takes a lot of work. And I know I'm asking teachers to work harder, but I also know it's better. And I've got an idea of how to create some software that would take the 10 tools that I use and put them into one, I guess. It's not like there's any, I'm not like inventing something new, but no one's put it all together. And so I guess I, if you're interested, let's talk. So I like that. I'd like to roll out the red carpet for you. Is there any place, uh, anything you want to share, books, where can people find you, um, any courses or anything that's out there? Please, red carpet's open for you. My, my website is simply johnbergman.com. Uh, find out there. Find out more about what I'm doing. We haven't really talked about sort of what I think is the advanced version of flip learning, which is mastery learning. So my students are in, uh, and that's the new book I'm writing or finished writing. It's it's kind of in the final publishing stages. And you know, mastery learning's been around for a long time. If you want to get your driver's license, you have to actually pass the test before they'll give it to you. If you want to become a doctor, you have to pass the boards. Or uh, if you want to be a lawyer, you have to pass the bar. That's what's called, yeah the bar or whatever and I think we need to implement a mastery learning. That's the beauty of flip learning is it meshes with the, the concept of mastery learning. So my students get to the end of a 
of a chapter or unit, and then if they don't pass, then they have to stay there until they learn it. And so my students are at slightly different places in the content of the curriculum. And I think that's where we need to head. And that's the focus of my website right now. It's like, let's, let's rethink how we could really get students to actually learn the topic, master the content. And I guess that's, that's, that's been my sort of, that's been my, my passion in the last uh, few years. In fact, really when I came back to the classroom, the intent was to do mastery learning but you can't do mastery learning well without the flip twist. So that's the point. I can multiply myself. So one student could be working on lesson four while another student's working on lesson two and everything in between. And uh, it just it just works. And it's so, so rich and powerful. So I guess that's, yeah. Find me at johnbergman.com. And, and John is weird and spelled. John has no H and Bergman has two N's. So <laughs> We'll definitely have the name uh, on, the, on the title. But uh, thank you so much for sharing that, um, and hopefully somebody will reach out also for the tech uh, thing. I'll definitely be asking around in my network uh, if anybody's interested in that. Cool. Thank you so much. You're welcome. It's been a great time. Yeah, what a, you, you got great questions. If you like this episode, you can check out our most recent one here. And if you haven't already, make sure you click here to subscribe and see the next one. But if you're interested in more tips and tricks, then make sure to join our Facebook group where you can find thousands of like-minded people and you get direct access